Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar today on the new EU Health Technology Assessment Regulation and implications for um, European um, patient organization, national patient organizations and patients. Uh, my name is Monika Rakovica. I am Access and Policy Manager at Myeloma Patients Europe. Um, we are uh, pleased and honored to have today uh, Mr. Bella Daika uh, from the European Commission, DG Health and Food Safety. Uh, his presentation will be followed by a moderated um, Q&A session, and we will close the webinar at 4 p.m. Please keep in mind for um, any of you joining us from different time zones that these are uh, these times are Central European summer times. Uh, Myeloma Patients Europe um, is an umbrella organization of Myeloma and the Light Chain Amyloidosis Patient Group. Um, you can read more about uh, MPE um, and our activities on uh, this webpage. Uh, the um, uh, co-organizer of, uh, of today's um, webinar is um, Alan, Acute Leukemia Advocates Network, um, which is an independent global network of patient organizations dedicated to changing outcomes of patients with acute leukemias by strengthening patient advocacy in this area. Um, you can read more about um, Alan's activities and projects uh, on their website here. Um, a few housekeeping rules before we start. Um, as I mentioned before, um, there will be a Q&A session um, after Isabella Daika's presentation. Uh, please use the Q&A window to post your questions and I will be asking them um, to the speaker on your behalf. The Q&A button, uh, you'll be able to find it uh, at the, the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, you can, whilst uh, within that window, you can also click on the like button to upvote uh, questions. Also, let us know what questions are more interesting for you. Um, overall, you'll be able to uh, see and hear um, either myself or Mr. Bella Daika, um, but you cannot um, hear um, any other uh, or see any other attendees. Um, if you cannot hear either myself or um, main speaker, uh, please check that your speakers are not muted and that the volume is set high. Um, please keep in mind that to post, uh, to share experiences or to post comments to the other attendees, you can use the chat function. Uh, if you are facing any technical difficulties, uh, please uh, let us know again in, in the same uh, chat. Uh, window and someone from the MBE team will reach out to you. Um, last mention is that webinar is being recorded and will be available on the MPE website and uh, social media channels. A few words about why we're holding this webinar today. Um, the health technology assessment is a key part of how new medicines reach patients. Um, and improved collaboration on HTA um, is important as it can potentially improve evidence base and consistency in decision making, which is always helpful. Um, in particular, the EU HTA regulation has been adopted and is currently in the implementation phase and will start in 2025 for certain medicines. Um, it's therefore important that patient and patient advocates are informed about the content and progress of the regulation um, particular understanding how um, and when they can be involved. Um, overall, the webinar will provide a general overview of the new HTA regulation and implications for European and national patient organizations and patients. Um, before we proceed, I would like to make a short announcement. Uh, we will have a second webinar uh, on the 26th of June um, from 3 to 4.30. Central European Summertime uh, would be a multi-stakeholder panel discussion on patient and clinician involvement in the UHTA regulation um, with um, speakers from um, various stakeholder group, including patient organizations, industry, um, uh, clinician organizations, and HA experts, among others. Uh, please register using the link that will be posted shortly in the chat. Further communication will be issues on MPE and Allen's social media channels, so please do keep an eye on our posts. Um, therefore, without further ado, um, it is a great pleasure to uh, introduce Mr. Bella Daika, 
policy officer and director general for health and food safety in the European Commission. Um, and he's also part of the team working on the implementation of the EU regulation on health technology assessment. I would like to thank, first of all, to Myeloma Patients Europe and Alan for co-hosting this webinar and, and organizing this webinar. And thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's very important that patient organizations uh, also uh, share the information about the uh, EU regulation on health technology assessment. Uh, I think we would need to reach a lot of stakeholders, a lot of patients, health professionals, and also people working for industry to raise awareness about what this regulation is about, how it's going to work, and how to get involved in the implementation. So thank you for this opportunity. I will try to share my screen. Um, so uh, I will try to briefly explain also uh, what uh, has technology assessment is, because in our experience, there is quite a bit of confusion about what it is uh, about and, and uh, how it relates to the marketing authorization process that is done by the European Medicines Agency. And, and what is really the difference between marketing authorization of a medicine and uh, the health technology assessment of, of a medicine. Um, so health technology assessment is a multidisciplinary process that uses uh, explicit and scientifically robust methods to assess the value of using a health technology. And this process is comparative. So if a new medicine appears on the market, uh, then uh, a comparator is picked uh, to, to look at the relative uh, effectiveness uh, and relative safety uh, and relative value of this uh, uh, new medicine. And this will help uh, to inform the health policy decision makers uh, in, the, in the countries to make efficient uh, uh, decisions about how this new medicine can be integrated and used in their health systems. Um, health technology assessment has various uh, domains. So there are the clinical domains and the non-clinical domains. Uh, the clinical domains re relate to uh, the, the health problem that uh, a, a medicine is trying to uh, cure, uh, the, the, the use technologies, the comparator technologies, the description of the, of the technology under assessment, the relative clinical effectiveness, relative safety. And the non-clinical domains include the economic evaluation, ethical aspects, organizational aspects, social aspects, and legal aspects. And because each health system in the EU is very different, the non-clinical domains remain uh, at member state level. So these judgments are made at, at member state level, even once we start the joint work under the uh, HTA regulation. And the HTA regulation concerns only the clinical domain. So the evidence that we will generate and assess under the HTA regulation concerns only the clinical domains. Uh, a key uh, point in, in health technology assessment is how we set up the, the scope of the assessment. And the scope concerns the population, that we are looking at when, when looking at a certain medication, the intervention, so what is the uh, indication of this medication, the comparator, what is the other technology that we are uh, comparing this new uh, medicine with, and what are the outcomes uh, for, for the patients uh, of, uh, of this treatment or process. And this is called the, the PICO. So this is the, the famous PICO that everybody is talking about. And uh, how this PICO will be defined is a key element of uh, the joint clinical assessments that, that will uh, happen uh, at EU level under the regulation. <clears throat> To say a few words about how uh, health technology assessment compares with the regulatory process. 
So the regulatory process actually under the European Commission, because the European Commission is the regulator for medicines authorization, but the European Medicines Agency uh, 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 carries out the assessment of uh, uh, marketing authorization requests. So there is a single licensing system for authorization of medicines to be marketed. Uh, there's a single EU legislation for this, and there is a well-defined and agreed assessment criteria at EU level in place already uh, today. Whereas for the health technology assessment part, uh, all member states have a different HTA system. There are national legislations and procedures in, in place and different methodologies and assessment criteria used. And you see the multiplicity of actors. There are member states where, are, where there are more than one agency or actor doing health technology assessment. So it's a, 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 a quite um, a diverse field uh, as, as it stands. And the uh, regulation, the health technology assessment regulation uh, will build a joint framework for the clinical assessment uh, and a joint methodology will be developed to do this uh, to do, do these assessments uh, and also a methodology for joint scientific consultations what remains at the national level is uh, the use of these joint clinical assessment reports in national decision making so the member states can still decide how they use these reports uh, in in the in the national decision making, the non-clinical assessments, such as the economic assessment uh, related uh, to the use of the medicine, and the decision on making pricing and reimbursement uh, decisions. So that also remains at uh, member member states uh, level. Of course, uh, what led to the HDA regulation is a long-standing cooperation between member states. It was a voluntary cooperation under joint actions financed by various uh, EU health uh, programs. And uh, out of this cooperation grew the uh, HDA regulation uh, that was adopted in December 2021. Uh, came into force in January 2022 and will be applicable as of 12th of January 2025. As I said, it, uh, it will build a, a framework and procedures for cooperation of member states on health technologies at union level and a mechanism for the submission of evidence in joint uh, clinic for joint clinical assessments. And uh, this submission of evidence has to happen once at EU level once this framework is in place and not to submit the same evidence in each member state, uh, in each member state separately. And uh, to do these assessments, the member state, the member states who are part of our governance structure that I will explain a little bit later, uh, work out common rules and methodologies. And the commission also puts um, in place six implementing acts for the implementation of the regulation. The vision behind uh, this regulation is to improve patient access to innovative technologies, to strengthen the quality of health technology assessment across the EU and avoid duplication and ensure efficiency uh, and secure long-term sustainability of EU HTA cooperation. The key principles uh, behind the regulation is that there is a, a joint work on common scientific clinical aspects of health technology assessment, through which we want to ensure high quality evidence-based decision making. Transparency and inclusiveness are also very key uh, elements of the regulation. And uh, this is why we engage so widely with stakeholders including patient organizations, health professionals, and, and industry. Uh, the whole process, the whole EU uh, health technology assessment work is driven by member states, HTA bodies. And uh, 
the regulation wants to ensure that actually the joint works work is used in national HTA processes. But again, as I mentioned before, the use of the report remains uh, uh, in the competence of the member states. And we, as the secretariat, the commission as the secretariat, we will have to um, uh, make a report in three years after the uh, application kicks in uh, to see how these reports were actually used uh, in uh, the national decision making of member states. Member states, as I said, uh, remain responsible for drawing conclusions on the added value for their health system and taking decisions on pricing and, and reimbursement. The implementation is uh, progressive because for joint clinical assessments, what we start the work uh, uh, with uh, in January 2025 will be cancer medicines and advanced therapy medicinal products. From January 2028, orphan medicinal products will be added. And from 2030, uh, the regulation will apply in full scope. In addition to medicinal products, uh, JCAs can be carried out on a selection of high-risk medical devices and in vitro medical devices. The, the high-risk medical devices are uh, the implantable, usually implantable so-called class three medical devices. And the select and uh, whereas in the medicinal products, uh, the start of the work is a valid marketing authorization application submitted to the EMA that falls in scope of the regulation. For medical devices, the coordination group will have to make a selection uh, of, of products and uh, the commission has to do an implementing act on this selection before uh, the joint clinical assessment of these products can start. An other part of the uh, HTA activities at EU level is the joint scientific consultations. Joint scientific consultations actually precede the joint clinical assessment. So the joint scientific uh, consultations are done at an early stage of uh, the development of a new product where the health technology developer can uh, come to uh, the uh, HTA coordination group and have an early dialogue about what sort of evidence would need to be collected during the development phase so that then uh, uh, this evidence can be submitted to joint clinical assessments. And this is something that would be done in parallel with the European Medicines Agency because they also do this early advice uh, to health technology developers. And uh, both in the joint clinical assessments and joint scientific consultations, patients uh, would be uh, involved uh, because their advice would be very essential uh, to make these uh, uh, assessments and consultations scientifically robust. Another area is the emerging health technologies area. We have a subgroup. I will show the governance system later for emerging health technologies. We would need to identify emerging health technologies for mainly for planning purposes so that we know what's coming up in the market. And for the identifications of identification of emerging health technologies, also the coordination group can consult uh, the HTA stakeholder network. Uh, they can provide input. So this way, patient organizations can also provide input. Uh, as I said, there is a uh, work ongoing to develop the methodologies for the joint work, and uh, there is a, an area which is called voluntary cooperation, where the member states can decide to uh, launch uh, joint scientific uh, consultations or the joint clinical assessments of, on, on products uh, that may not necessarily fall directly in the scope of the, of the regulation, so not the mandatory scope of the regulation. So here is the governance structure that uh, we have put in place already. Uh, and uh, these groups are working very hard to prepare everything for the start of the application of the regulation. 
So the main governance body is the Member State Coordination Group on Health Technology As Assessment. And it has uh, four subgroups, one on joint clinical assessments, one on joint scientific consultations, one for the identification of emerging health technologies, and uh, one on methodology. Their work, the coordination group's work, is supported by the uh, HTA stakeholder network that we have also already uh, put in place. Uh, the stakeholder network includes uh, patient organizations, uh, uh, non-governmental organizations in the field of health, health technology developers, associations, and health professionals, uh, societies. And uh, the, the aim of the stakeholder network is to facilitate a dialogue between stakeholders and, and the coordination group. Uh, in the regulation, there is a, a list of criteria for membership in the uh, HTA stakeholder network. And one of the key criteria is that these organizations have to be um, mul multinational, let's put it that way. So they have to cover several uh, member states to be, uh, to be eligible, to be members. So national organizations by default, therefore cannot be members of this HTA stakeholder network. Uh, we, as the European Commission, we provide the secretariat uh, to, the, to the member states coordination group, but of course also we organize the meetings of the uh, stakeholder network and the Euro European Commission chairs uh, the stakeholder network. We provide administrative, technical and IT support. And as far as IT support is concerned, we are building a HTA IT platform to which uh, the members of the stakeholder network uh, can have access. I have to correct myself, it's the representative, representatives, the nominated representatives of the members of the HTA stakeholder network who can have um, access to this IT platform where uh, the joint work will take place. And it's uh, important to point out that the work uh, that is going to take place, so the joint clinical assessments and joint scientific consultations are uh, confidential. So anybody who has uh, access to this uh, platform uh, uh, will have to respect the confidentiality uh, arrangements that uh, are in place in this framework. Um, this is where we are with the impl implementation. So uh, as I said, we have already put in place the governance structure. Uh, and at the moment we are in the process of uh, drafting the implementing acts and the coordination group, we, the European Commission is drafting the implementing acts and the coordination group is in the process of drafting the guidance documents. Uh, so far, there, there is uh, a guidance on com comparisons that has been published by the coordination group. And uh, we have already made publicly available a text of the first implementing act on joint clinical assessments of medicinal products, uh, which will be soon adopted by the, by the European Commission. And another five implementing acts are in progress, but I will have a slide on that as well. Um, so the application will start in January 2025, and I will not repeat what I have said uh, uh, before about the uh, stepwise approach uh, that we follow in terms of bringing uh, medicines uh, and medicine, med medical devices in scope of the, of the regulation. <clears throat> to show you uh, how the uh, stakeholder network uh, looks like, we have uh, 45 organizations in the stakeholder network. 15 of them are patient organizations, so they are very well represented and they represent the various therapeutic areas. Uh, we have 13 health professional organizations, seven health technology developers, four uh, academic societies, uh, three payer organizations and three other NGOs. And we also have, apart from the 45, two uh, observers, that the two observers are the WHO Euro and EIT Health. 
Uh, and these are the implementing acts that would have to be put in place before January 2025. So the one that will be adopted uh, hopefully soon by the European Commission is the procedural rules for JCA of medicinal products. And the work is ongoing on the other five. So we have, uh, 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 we, ha we, we will have implementing act for the procedural rules for the prevention of conflict of interest, the uh, on exchange of information with the European Medicines Agency, for JSC, uh, JSC of medicinal products, JSC of medical devices, and uh, the procedural rules for JCA of medical devices. Uh, how patients uh, can be involved? Uh, already the uh, implementing act for joint clinical assessment of medicinal products um, uh, has uh, a few elements which indicates how patients would be involved in the uh, joint work. So the commission would, uh, for each product under assessment, the commission would have to identify, uh, identify patient uh, uh, to be involved in the assessment. Uh, but the selection of the uh, patients will be made by the joint uh, clinical assessment subgroup. And of course, the patient's participation there is subject to conflict of interest checks confidentiality agreement and data protection rules. Joint scientific consultations, we don't have yet an implementing act there, but this is what the regulation indicates, that the JSC uh, subgroup shall ensure that patients, clinical experts, and on other re relevant experts are given an opportunity to provide input during the preparation of a draft joint scientific consultation outcome document. And this includes the organization of a meeting for exchange of views. Of course, the implementing act will add more details, but uh, as we don't uh, have a text yet, uh, I, I cannot uh, say more than that uh, on, on this. And in the identification of emerging health technologies, the members of the HTA stakeholder network can uh, serve as a source of information. So, they will be uh, consulted on uh, emerging health technologies, uh, but also the coordination group may consult other stakeholders who are not necessarily members of the stakeholder network uh, for these purposes. How patients can be prepared to uh, participate in HTA? Uh, as I said, HTA is a very uh, technical and scientific uh, process, and sometimes it may be difficult to understand or judge uh, uh, for, for lay people uh, the contents of joint clinical assessment reports, draft reports on, on which, uh, for instance, the patient voice would be very uh, useful to, to be heard. Um, Therefore, we, we have launched under the eu for health program uh, a call for um, proposals for, for grants um, to train patients to participate in EU-level uh, health technology uh, assessments. And two uh, projects uh, got uh, grants. One is the HTA for Patients that is run by the Advanced uh, uh, Training for uh, increased patient involvement in HTA. I'm sorry, there is a, a little error in my slide. So the U party stands for advanced training for increased patient involvement in HTA. And U kappa is the European capacity building uh, for patients uh, that is coordinated by Eurordis, the rare diseases Europe. Uh, and these uh, two projects train patients, uh, provide training, uh, both online and classroom trainings for patients to prepare them for participation in the uh, EU level joint work. We also do awareness raising events. Uh, we organize these events regionally and so far five events have uh, taken place covering uh, South East Europe, um, the Nordic countries, the Baltic countries and Poland and the Southern uh, countries. Uh, we are also the Beneluxa countries. We had an event for them. Uh, the, all the recordings of these events are on the commission website, on the HTA website. So you can check uh, 
if uh, there was an event in your region. And there are two more events upcoming uh, this year, one uh, in Budapest in September for the Central European countries, and one in November for stakeholders from France and Germany. And uh, so if you are uh, in the audience from these countries, please, uh, the registration is open already open for Budapest and we will soon announce the registration for uh, the uh, event for German and French stakeholders as well. This is the Europa website uh, uh, where uh, we have uh, a page, actually a, a, a whole website on HTA, uh, several pages, where you can check the latest news. Uh, we publish the minutes of the meetings of the coordination group, the subgroups, the stakeholder network. Uh, there are some communication documents like Q&A, fact sheets, uh, and you can inform yourself about the state of play of the work. We also have a rolling plan that is regularly updated, and you can see uh, what's coming in the preparatory phase as well. So just to conclude, uh, we are co-creating uh, a new system with all the member states and all stakeholders. And inclusiveness and transparency are key, principle, key principles for this uh, work. And we uh, need the commitment of, of everyone uh, involved and everyone interested to secure smooth implementation. We have only eight months left to go until the application date. So there is still a lot of work to be done until then, but uh, we are very hopeful and uh, confident that we will be able to put everything in place to start the work in January, 2025. But thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, I'd just like to thank you for a very um, informative and comprehensive overview of the UHDA regulation. I see we got a few questions uh, in the Q&A section. Um, there is one um, asking, how do you think a joint clinical assessment will be used by countries? What will the impact be for countries and patients? Well, if you look at the landscape uh, uh, of HTA across Europe, we can see uh, quite a, a big discrepancy in availability of evidence uh, for uh, the national uh, health technology assessments. Because uh, in some countries, uh, this process is started uh, almost automatically when a new product comes to the market. In some countries, uh, the system waits for an application by the health technology developer to start this process. And we also see that um, the, the process usually starts after the marketing authorization has already happened. So uh, it takes sometimes, uh, if, let's say in the faster countries, 100, 200 days uh, to, to complete the health technology assessment. But in, in other countries, uh, the, the, the health technology assessment is not done only after years uh, once a medicine appears on the market. And uh, we hope really that with this uh, regulation, we could reduce this time uh, to, to, to do the health technology assessment and to, to help authorities to make the decisions to um, uh, bring uh, these products uh, faster to the patients uh, because patient access to these products are, are, uh, are key to innovative products. And we also see that um, because of this delayed access with the, with the current uh, uh, systems in place, also results in disparities in treatments uh, for patients, availability of uh, innovative medicines in, in certain countries. And this translates also into uh, survivor rates, uh, if we talk about cancer or um, expected uh, uh, survival. Uh, so we hope that with the, with the, with the regulation, we will uh, help uh, to generate the evidence faster that will help the national authorities 
to uh, decide how they wish to give uh, 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 access to these new medicines and new health technologies, you know, not only medicines, but also medical devices uh, uh, to patients in their health systems. You, um, another question is, you mentioned that um, well, this certain parts of the process, the EMA and the European Commission will collaborate or be concurrent. Um, one question we have is how will the EMA and European Commission collaborate on patient involvement? As I understand, the processes are likely to be concurrent. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Indeed, uh, the, the process of the uh, joint clinical assessment and the uh, marketing authorization process uh, will run in parallel. The JCA will be uh, kick-started with the uh, valid uh, marketing authorization application for a medicine that falls in the scope of the uh, HTA regulation. So first it's going to be uh, medicines for the treatment of cancer and advanced therapy medicinal products. And uh, uh, to be honest, I cannot, cannot answer how the EMA is using uh, patients in their assessments at, at, uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, we will co co collaborate with the EMA on exchange of information and we will have an implementing act uh, that will regulate uh, this exchange of information with the EMA. But the health technology assessment, the, 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 joint, uh, uh, the joint clinical assessment process will, although it will run par parallel, uh, it will uh, be a, a, a different process than the, than the marketing uh, authorization process. So therefore, uh, the uh, joint uh, clinical assessment subgroup that will conduct or uh, supervise these assessments, because of course, the commission will also, uh, uh, the, the, for the purposes of the um, joint clinical assessments, the um, uh, coordination group will have to appoint an assessor and a, and a co-assessor as it's done by uh, the, the, the European Medicines Agency. But these assessors and co-assessors essentially cannot be the same. So cannot be the same assessor and co-assessor for the uh, joint clinical assessment who does the uh, marketing uh, uh, authorization uh, assessment. Um, and uh, for, for patient involvement, of course, we could rely on various sources to identify uh, patient, uh, patients uh, for, for the assessment, and, uh, and this could be also the European Medicines Agency, but essentially those patients uh, who will be involved in JCA, I don't think that they could be involved in the uh, marketing authorization process of the same uh, medication. So the, the two processes will be will be done separately in this sense. Thank you. Um, I have a few um, questions actually about um, selections of, of patients for JCA um, or how patients will be involved in HTRA process, um, keeping in mind that they're uh, some have specific knowledge or like treatment characteristic or outcome or design for clinical trial. Um, how um, how would the, the impact priorities for patients? What are these impact priorities for patients and other stakeholders? Uh, for the selection of patients, um, it will be the JCA subgroup uh, that will decide on the selection of patients for each uh, uh, medication. But of course, uh, for the identification, it will be important to, uh, to, to let's say, to pre-select uh, patients who have the experience in the given therapeutic area, also who have been trained to participate in HTA. Also, there is a question mark about whether um, patients can be consulted in writing or in uh, or it has to be a, a, a meeting where uh, 
the patient can be given, let's say, uh, the information in a digestible format so that they can contribute uh, with their views on, on that information and not to, uh, you know, it will be quite uh, difficult sometimes for a patient to receive, I don't know, a 200 page report and, and try to digest or filter out what is important for them or not. It's still uh, all under this discussion how to best involve uh, patients in the uh, joint clinical assessments and what would be uh, the best way to get their um, uh, views and input. Uh, I think the patients uh, can, can give very useful in input, especially on the outcomes uh, of, of, uh, of a treatment. Uh, and uh, uh, it will be up to the assessor and the co-assessor to take these views into, into account. Uh, what is mandatory is that these views would need to be somehow reflected in the joint clinical assessment report, of course, in an anonymized way. And uh, we already see also in the, um, uh, in the uh, Implementing Act for Joint Clinical Assessments of Medicinal Products that the personal data of patients will be um, very much guarded, so we will not we will not publish any data about uh, about patients apart from their views that they have contributed to the assessments. Mm -hmm. um, we have a we have a question about um, timelines. Um, someone mentioned that um, the proposed process seemed to leave only two weeks for patient organizations to contribute. Um, and they would see it as a challenge for many organizations as they might not have the resources to contribute in a shorter amount of time. Um, would you, um, maybe, maybe it might be too early at this point, but um, would you um, have an answer what, how this would impact contributions for, from patient organizations? I think for, for the um conduct of the joint clinical assessments, we would have to distinguish between the involvement of the patients and the potential contribution of patient organizations that might be re requested uh, by the joint clinical assessment, uh, assessor, co-assessor. Um, because uh, according to the regulation, uh, the involvement of uh, patients is, if you like, mandatory. Whereas uh, the regulation itself doesn't say anything, uh, the involvement of uh, patient organizations in, in the joint clinical assessment. Uh, but the implementing act indeed includes the possibility to consult um, uh, patient organizations if the, if the assessor and co-assessor uh, uh, would like to get that, that input, but it's not a mandatory uh, element that the timeline ca can be quite uh, tight as 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 we know this is a tight uh, uh, schedule for for everyone um, because th this is tied to the uh, EMA uh, uh, timeline timetable for marketing authorizations but we also know that there are uh, various uh, clock stops also in the um, EMA uh, time timeline. And uh, so this can actually uh, prolong uh, the, the joint clinical assessment as well, uh, because the, um, the, the, the main point is that the joint clinical assessment would uh, have to be, the joint clinical assessment report would have to be made, be made public uh, 30 days after uh, the, the marketing authorization uh, of, a, of a medicine. So to work towards that timeline, indeed, there are big milestones to be reached. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes these consultative uh, uh, opportunities can be quite, um, let's say, tight in terms of timing. Um, there's a question from someone asking if you could explain in a bit more detail how the national HDA bodies would use the assessments and reports of this new system and with um, national funding would have an impact on um, how they're going to use, how they're going to process the information. 
uh, the member states would have to take these uh, joint clinical assessment reports into account in their uh, national HTA processes. But I said, as I said, the, um, uh, the, the HTA process is not just about the clinical uh, part. There are mm -hmm. other uh, assessments, economic assessment, uh, uh, ethical uh, considerations uh, to, to, uh, to be taken into account in, in the member states' decision making. Um, and uh, we, will, we will have to make a report in three years' time. So the European Commission will have to make a report in three years' time to see how these joint clinical assessment reports were in the end used in the national decision making. So it would be difficult to, to, to prejudge at this stage because we have not even started the work on joint uh, clinical assessments to, uh, to see how the, the reports will be used. Uh, we hope that the reports will be uh, of high quality and scientifically rob robust uh, so that the member states will eventually uh, uh, tr trust these reports and, and uh, base their decisions, national decisions on these uh, reports. Um, we uh, had a few um, uh, questions about um, the France event that you've um, announced and um, they're curious what, where they can find information about it, if they would like to um, to register, if they want to find out more about it. Sorry about what I didn't catch your... Uh, the... Men the, um, there's an event. Ah, the event that we will organize yes. in Budapest yes. In, yes. in September. So yes. we have published this event already on the Commission's website. Um, maybe I can put uh, the link in the chat where registration is available. Uh, it will be a hybrid event, mm -hmm. but uh, as we work with some limitations in terms of on-site participation, we uh, have already, so with the partner organizations, with the partner uh, health technology assessment agencies with which we co-organize this event, we have already uh, invited um, uh, the, the the stakeholders on site. Oh, I see. I may not be able to post in the chat, but um, so in any case, if you go to the HTA website of the Commission, uh, then there you will find this event quite quite easily. And uh, registration for online participation is always open. So as I said, on-site participation is limited, but online uh, participation uh, you, you can register. And, uh, and if you are a stakeholder from uh, Croatia, Slovenia, Hungary, Czech Republic, or Slovakia, and uh, you would like to come on site, but you have not received an invitation, then you can contact me uh, uh, and, and I can try to see if uh, on-site on participation would still be possible. Thank you. Um, I have another question um, about the next, uh, the public consultation for the next implementing act. If you uh, have any idea at this point, when would that start? It's difficult to say at this stage because uh, to start uh, the the uh, public uh, consultation, we would first of all would have to have a solid um, draft uh, agreed in the comitology committee with the member states. Uh, but hope I hope that this will happen uh, uh, rather soon, and then uh, the, the public consultation can start. I, after that, in a few weeks' time, after the agreement in the comitology committee. Thank you. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, someone asking if um, do you think there would be additional opportunities for countries of similar economic status to further cooperate with the aim to harmonize data and speed up the process? There is uh, the part on voluntary cooperation that is uh, made possible by the regulation. So there, uh, certain member states can uh, initiate um, a closer cooperation 
um, on various issues that 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 may be of interest to them. Um, at the moment, uh, the, the, uh, this has been discussed uh, already at the coordination group, whether uh, there is scope at the moment for voluntary cooperation. And uh, we have uh, a working group in place that is looking at this possibility. But in 2025, I think the coordination group has already agreed that the priority will be on the mandatory work. So to get that on the way, and then look uh, at uh, voluntary cooperation uh, a little bit later, once we know that this process uh, uh, works well. Um, one of our audience member is asking if, um, is there a plan to develop joint patient access scheme with perhaps patient experts involved? I'm, I'm not aware of, of such uh, plans, but it might be a good idea. Maybe the uh, stakeholder, the patient organizations in the stakeholder network can elaborate a little bit on what that would mean and how that would work. And uh, and uh, this is something that maybe uh, could be could be considered. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask. Um, because there's going to be patient involvement at the EUHTA level, um, there would be also patient involvement at the national level. Um, is there um, this possible interplay between the two? Is that taken into consideration under the new regulation, or would that be uh, left to um, member states? If member states in involve patients uh, at the moment, that's uh, something that, that, that is very good, but uh, the point of the uh, joint clinical assessments and EU level is that we don't duplicate the work. So if a medicine uh, is being assessed at EU level, the national, um, uh, in the national HTA system, they should not be doing an assessment, uh, a clinical assessment I'm talking about for that same medicine, because the, the whole point would be to avoid uh, this duplication of work, also to avoid that the uh, health technology developer would have to file the same dossier, the same evidence or similar dossier with similar ev evidence for the same medicine to, to, to various uh, uh, countries. So um, uh, in, in that sense, a patient that is participating in the joint clinical assessment of a certain medicine at EU level uh, should not participate in the, in the uh, uh, national process for the same uh, medicine, unless maybe uh, if that uh, input from the patient involves other aspects other than the clinical aspects, because we, we at the EU level, we really will focus on the clinical aspects. So if the if, if the patient can give input in the national process on ethical or uh, organizational or other considerations, maybe that is still uh, a way to involve patients in the national process for the same uh, medicine. But uh, for the clinical part, if we, if we do one assessment at EU level, I think the idea is not, not to have uh, a similar clinical assessment ongoing in a, in a member state. And I think this touches on, there was another question about um, someone who's worried that um, to have their opinion considered, they would only need to have a certain fluency in English and have access to umbrella organizations, but um, they would be a, they, they could be involved at the national level. Um, depending on their expertise, of course. Yes, def definitely. Thank you. Um, I think we are getting close to the end, uh, the time that we had today. Um, I'd like to thank you very, very much for, uh, for your presentation um, and um, for giving us your insights and reply to the many, many questions that came toward you. Um, I'd like to thank you um, very much to um, the participants today and everyone who posted questions. 
Um, you can see uh, again, um, my colleague posted the, um, the link to registration to the webinar that we are going to have on the 6th, 26th of June. Uh, so if you found it, uh, the, the webinar, you had some burning questions that we didn't have time to ask today, or perhaps you have other ideas in the meanwhile, please participate in that one um, and ask your questions uh, on the webinar on 26th of June. Um, Thank you. Thank you again so much. Um, I would, yes, I would like to thank you again for the invitation. And I hope uh, this this was very useful for me also to know what uh, are the key concerns of patients and uh, the key questions uh, of patients. And uh, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, all uh, in the audience to follow our work to, to through the website and through the events that we are we are organizing. Thank you.